Tribe, Book 2, Todd Mills Mystery, author R.D. Zimmerman, publisher, Scrib Pub, Minneapolis, Minnesota, narrator, Eric Ost. Chapter 3 Here, this is it, said Rick, seated on the passenger seat of the Pontiac. Pull over. He stared up at the house, a one-story bungalow, nestled in the low hills on the edge of Santa Fe. She'd always been an early riser, and there were a handful of lights on this morning, which meant she was already up, probably getting ready for work, and probably alone. He knew she hadn't remarried, and if she was anything like her old self, Martha would still be a loner. She'd never had many friends, never much like going out. Then again, he hadn't seen her in a nearly a decade. Rick took his leather-bound Bible from the dashboard, closed his eyes, and bent his head forward in silent prayer. He needed information. Had to have it. And he prayed to God that his trip from Colorado Springs would be fruitful. For a child's life was at stake. He was a tall man with thinning hair and snowy white sideburns, his long face ashen, and he just wanted what was best for all. What had happened was ridiculous, absurd, and with the help of the Lord Jehovah, he was going to put a stop to it. Help me right this terrible wrong, he begged silently. Help me punish those who have transgressed my family. He turned to the driver, Paul, a quiet, heavy-set fellow with a mustache, a prominent member of the congregation for almost five years now. When all this mess had begun, Paul, who'd worked for years installing security systems, had been more than happy to offer his help. Yes, agreed Paul. They needed to rescue Zeb and Ripka. They needed to bring them back into the fold of love. Is it doable? asked Rick, studying the house. Paul stared at the telephone wires leading to the low structure and said, Of course it is. Good, Rick added. And she shouldn't be a problem either. If she's anything like her old self, she's easily intimidated. Paul shrugged and reached for his briefcase, from which he took a small white plastic box and his pistol. You never know. Right. I'll take the carrot, said Rick, slipping his Bible into the large pocket of his raincoat. And you take the stick. If things got nasty, then so be it. There was so much more at stake than this reclusive woman, and as the two men walked past a couple of tall cactuses and up the edge of her short drive, Rick checked up and down the street. It was too early. No one was out. No one had seen them thus far. He just prayed to the Lord Jehovah that they'd come to the right place, that he would get that which he so desperately needed. Rick stopped at the edge of the carport and nodded to Paul, who, with the small white box in one hand and the pistol in the other, trotted along the side of the house and disappeared into the darkness. Rick looked up the street, saw a half dozen houses just like this, earth-colored homes with flat roofs. He peered the other way, saw another half dozen of the same. But no one was about, he realized with pleasure, for after all these years, he would still relish the opportunity to punish her. Less than five minutes later, Paul reappeared. Everything's okay? asked Rick, his voice low and noting that Paul no longer carried the small device. Be okay. These one-story houses are never a problem. Relieved that their first piece of business was taken care of, Rick silently led the way around the front of the garage and right up to the front door before Rick reached for the doorbell. Though he motioned to Paul to stand out of sight, the two of them would certainly be intimidating, whereas he alone might be able to get her to talk. He ran one hand back over his hair, straightened his shirt, and recalled how he had once loved her. She was, after all, the first to forgive his earthly sins, the first to embrace him with unqualified love, the first to show him the light of God. Taking a deep breath, he pressed the bell, and a moment later, he heard a television silenced inside. Some steps. Next, the front lights burst on. Who's there? She called from both the behind the locked door. It's me, Martha. Rick. A pause. Who? Rick, your ex-husband. Oh, Christ. As if she had simply turned away from the door and was returning to her new show, there was nothing. Then a few long seconds later, there was a fumbling of a lock, the twisting of a knob, and finally the dark wooden door secured by a thin brass chain eased back a few inches. Hesitantly, she peered out. 
This handsome woman with the broad cheekbones, deep set eyes, and the red lipstick smeared across her full lips. Good morning. It's been a long time, said Martha, wearing a turquoise sweater, shirt, and her blonde hair pulled back behind her head. I just wanted to see what you looked like after, what, ten years? You look wonderful, my dear. Barely a day older. Well, it must be my worldly ways. Look at these bright colors I'm wearing, she said, pulling at his sleeve of her sweatshirt. And lipstick, too. Not to mention eyeliner. Oh, and I even color my hair now. Because after all, there's no sense in letting my gray show. What do you think? Isn't it my fall from God becoming? Don't I look just positively wicked? Martha, please. Christ, I wish I could say you look great, but you don't. In fact, you look like shit. You're going bald, Rick, and gray too. Look at your sideburns. They're completely white. You know you look 20 years older than when I last saw you. She eyed him up and down. Of course, the weight you put on doesn't help. How much? Twenty pounds? Thirty? Wow, you really let yourself go. Martha, I... Goodbye, Rick. Sorry you came such a long way for such a short conversation, but I have to finish getting ready for work, she said, pushing the door shut. It's been nice glimpsing you. Hope I never see you again. He rammed his hand out, caught the door... Where is he? Who? Our son. Seb? Yes, I do believe that's his name. Where is he? She shrugged. I haven't the faintest. Martha, please, no games. You can sure as hell bet he's not here, if that's what you're wondering. Rick felt his spine tighten, and he glanced down at the ground, ran one foot slowly along the concrete. You know he's kidnapped our granddaughter, don't you? Really? How very interesting. I didn't know taking a helpless young child out of the clutches of a religious cult was called that. I thought he came under the category of rescue. Martha, it's very serious. We're not only talking about the two most important people in my life, we're talking about the safety and health of a mere infant. I beg you with all my heart, if you love them as much as I do, then tell me what you know. He paused. After all, he's taken her out of Colorado. We could have the FBI get involved. Oh my, what a good idea, Martha smiled. In fact, maybe I'll call them right now. Martha, I saved Seb from drugs and Satan before. I can save him again. Knock off the bullshit, Rick. You might as well give up. He's never going back there. For what little I do know, I believe he was going to hide her somewhere. Somewhere you'd never find her. But he does have her, doesn't he? Frankly, my dear, I have no idea. Then who does? Maybe someone in Mexico. Maybe one of his friends in California. Oh, Canada. He mentioned something about going up there. She looked at him wryly, gathered her courage, and said, But that's a good idea. Now that you mention it, I'll call the FBI, and then they'll investigate the congregation. Maybe they'd even shut down your fucking church, burn down your little compound of quackery, and put all your goddamn nuts in jail where you and your fucking god belong. I hope to hell. A huge mass began swirling to Rick's right and swept him aside. It was Paul, his fury erupting at the sound of her blasphemous words, and in an instant Paul and all his brute force were hurling against the front door. Under his sheer force, the brass chain snapped in two and the door went hurling inward. Martha screamed as the door hit her in the face and threw her back onto the floor. Paul surged inside, zeroing in on her aiming his pistol right at her forehead. Don't, Paul! shouted Rick, rushing in after him. Go ahead, you fuckers! screamed Martha, lying on her back, her nose bleeding. Kill me! Is that what you want to do when I left? 
Go on, you goddamn Bible-thumping Jesus freaks. Kill me. Now's your chance. Shut up, Martha. Eat shit, Rick. She looked right up at Paul. Don't listen to that bossy ass. He's always telling everyone what to do, how to act. Why do you think I ran away? I was looking for love and trust, a spiritual place, but that's not what I found. Your God is evil, evil and awful. Go on, pull the fucking trigger. If you kill me, I'll meet the real maker, and he's certainly not yours. Seeing Paul steady his aim, Rick jumped in, grabbed him by the arm. No, he nudged Paul back, shielded Martha. She still hasn't told us where she he is. And I won't. I could give a shit what you do to me. I took your beatings before and I'll take them again. And I'm telling you a thing about my son. She wiped her nose, grinned. You know what, Rick? I was the one who told him to do it, to take her. I told him if he had any brains, he'd get the hell out of there. Your church is the biggest garbage pile I've ever seen. This bitch, Rick knew, was nothing if not resolute. He'd been married to her for almost 11 years when she'd broken with him, the congregation, and taken their young son and fled. He'd looked and looked, spending an entire six months driving around the country in search of them. Finally, he'd hired an investigator, but that too proved fruitless. It was as if the two of them, Martha and the young Zebulun, had simply evaporated. He'd never stopped praying, however, and finally a miracle occurred. One day, some three years ago, his son Zeb just walked up the dirt road to the congregation's compound. But now, Zeb was gone once again. His family was breaking apart one more time, and Rick knew it was because of this woman lying before him. This was the second time she'd done this. Taking his son from him, he wasn't going to let her succeed. Rick leaned down to her, lifted his right fist up to his left shoulder, then swung down, striking Martha on the chin as hard as he could, shouting, God damn, have mercy on you! Martha cried out and wormed her way backward. Blood now gushed from her bottom lip as well as her nose, and she clutched her face with her right hand. You're filled with the devil. You're desperately wicked. Rick turned to Paul and shouted, Watch her! He left them, stormed through the small living room, found a hall, and charged to the rear of the house. The first door proved to be a bathroom, the next a bedroom. He ducked in, saw her bed, her clothes, her makeup, and he tore through it all, flinging her clothes out of the closet, kicking her shoes aside, pulling her sweat sweaters from a shelf. Then he turned to his small dressing table, and with one great holler, he took his arm and whipped her cosmetics and brushes her mirror and creams from the table and all over the floor. He couldn't believe it all. So many colors, so many vain items, and so many different kinds of fabrics. Cottons combined with polyesters, wools stitched with elastic bands. Nothing pure, nothing simple. Spinning around, he grabbed the salmon-colored sheets. They should be pure white! From her double bed, ripped them loose and then tore them in half. Next, he dumped over her small bedside table sending a clock radio lamp and a couple of books crashing onto the floor, his righteous anger hotter than ever. He rushed out of the room, across the hall, into another small bedroom. He froze. There was a single bed on one side, some baseball posters on the wall. Of course, this had been where Zeb had grown up. These were his boyhood things. Certainly, he put together that plastic model of a plane hanging from the ceiling. Of course, he'd written his high school reports on that little typewriter. Rick hurled open the closet door, saw books, a few clothes, some boxes, a baseball glove, and bat. Dear Jehovah, all those years Zeb had been so close, right here in Santa Fe, and Rick had known it. And then he wondered if this was where his son had first come with the baby. Perhaps the thought drove him crazy with rage, and Rick grabbed the bat and smashed it all the model the typewriter, the radio, the lamp. When all of it lay in pieces on the floor, he stopped, his breathing fast and heavy, but still he didn't have what he came for. He dropped the baseball bat and charged out. Returning to the living room, he found Paul still aiming his gun directly at Martha, who was now on her couch, her head leaned back, seated next to a small basket that contained the remote controls for the television and VCR. 
she pressed the corner of a small frail blanket to her nose in a futile attempt to stop the bleeding. Rick pointed a finger right at her, and a voice like thunder from the mountain shouted, Where is my son? In response, her right hand shot out the middle finger, pointing high from her fist. Up your tight ass! And Rick yelled, Lord have mercy on you! Likewise, I'm sure, he spun to his left, bursting into the kitchen. A small space, mostly white, a little table at the far end. His eyes darting around, he took it all in. The blender, the sink, the microwave, a steaming pot of coffee. Lastly, he hit upon the small stack of mail on the far edge of the counter and next to the phone. He dove into the envelopes, his fingers desperately tearing through the electrical bill, some Christmas cards, a visa bill, as well as... Wait, he thought, his hand shaking. He thumbed back through it all, returning to one of the cards. He saw the postmark, noted the address on the back. Why did this look familiar? It was something Zeb himself had once mentioned, wasn't it? And then he ripped open the envelope, which contained a brief note, as well as two photographs. One of a woman, another of a house. Of course, Rick realized. Why hadn't he thought to look there? Out of nowhere, a siren started screaming. Dear Lord, realized Rick, it was the burglar alarm. He stuffed the envelope and its contents into his pocket, and by the time Rick rushed back to the living room, Paul was upon Martha, batting a remote control out of her hands. All Martha did, however, was laugh. He's not so smart, is he? She shouted almost gleefully to Rick. I told him I was going to turn on the TV, but instead I took the remote to my alarm system. I hit the panic button, you assholes. The police are on the way. Rick strode directly toward her, raised his fist, and as Paul held her, struck Martha on the chin. A fresh spray of blood flew across the room, and hearing the crack of her jaw and the pitch of her scream, Rick was glad she deserved all this pain and more. Unfortunately, there just wasn't time. Grabbing Paul by the arm, Rick shouted, Come on, let's get out of here! But move it! As they charged out of the house, Rick paused at the front door, glanced back, saw the battered Martha slumped on the couch and laughing hysterically. Or was she crying? Her blonde hair was matted, her clothing wet with blood. Pathetic. Demonic. How had he ever loved her? Never mind, he thought, turning and racing through the dull morning light toward the car. There was indeed a god, his god, and he was great, for he answered Rick's prayers yet again. Praise the Almighty Lord, it was he who had shown the postmark to Rick, he who was leading Rick to his fallen son. Praise God. Praise God, praise God. The two men rushed to the car, climbed in and sped away. Two blocks later, just like any law-abiding citizens, they pulled to the side of the street and let the police car zoom by. Watching it disappear in the rearview mirror, Paul asked, Where do now? Where? replied Rick smugly as he patted his pocket. Minneapolis, of course. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.